Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining us. It's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. You're with us for today's network webinar, Do You Need to Change the Narrative About Your Cause? We're joined today actually at Network HQ. Really psyched to have him. Doug Hathaway is with us. Doug and his team have done a lot of research on what makes certain narratives sticky in the minds of Americans. Sometimes overcoming negative narratives is a difficult barrier to policy change and progress. We actually have to rethink the way we think about an issue in order to get unstuck. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And my guess is coming now on the heels of an election where, at the end of the day, elections are ultimately about stories, the stories we tell ourselves. We're going to have a chance to kind of dig in and find out where your issues may lie in the new frontier and the future ahead of us. Um, we're going to be fo focusing particularly on negative narratives about the issues that you care about and find new ways to drive new positive narratives in service of your organization's mission or cause or the outcomes you're seeking to see in the world. A couple quick logistical items before we get underway. If you've been with us before, just bear with me, you know this stuff. We're going to take your questions throughout the presentation. To do so, to ask a question, you're going to use that chat box down in the lower left-hand corner. I invited a bunch of y'all to uh, shout in with your, uh, your name or a question you walked in the door with. If you can go ahead and do that now just to make sure the chat box is working for you. We're going to be talking to each other throughout this. We're also on Twitter. Our friend Yabby is going to be uh, making notes of these proceedings live at the hashtag ComnetLive. That's C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E, if I can spell properly, C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. You'll be able to see the notes that she makes there. Uh, and as always, we record this thing. We've, in fact, we've already started. Uh, we'll post it online for free replays at ComNetwork.org in the next couple of days. Thanks again for joining us. Hey, Sarah. Uh, thank you for checking in, and our buddy Sarah Westlake from Art Place America, she's back in Brooklyn. We loved having you in San Francisco. Thanks very much. Doug, you want to go ahead and take it away, and we'll see the rest of you. Lindsay, what's going on? And Melissa, there's a lot of you guys. I'll say hello to you in the chat box. Doug, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Uh, thanks a lot. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll dive right into it. I'm going to tell you a bit about this program called American Aspirations, which has been supported by the Ford Foundation. Um, and the topic of changing negative narratives. Uh, the Ford Foundation um, found that its grantees uh, said they needed help confronting um, what they call cultural narratives that drive inequality, ideas about America itself, that um, their grantees, most of whom work in the area of social justice, um, run up against big ideas that sort of got in the way of promoting government policies um, for social programs, for example. I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about. And so we've been working um, with dozens of organizations that work on all kinds of issues um, to understand how they communicate about these issues and how they can engage at that level of a cultural narrative, a big idea, because these are narratives about society, about the country that frame people's perceptions of the way things are and how the way the world works and their preferences for the way things should be. And I have they, a feeling we're going to get into a little Daniel Kahneman before too long. Yes, yeah, he's, he's never far behind <laughs> when we start talking about these. Because we do bring the science of communication into our work. Um, so we're talking about cognitive psychology, social psychology, and other elements of psychology. But what's interesting is the science says that storytelling is the most effective way to communicate for lots of reasons. Um, so we take a narrative approach to all of this work, but there's different ways to think and talk about narratives. So we're going to use a couple definitions here. Um, and we'll dive into the first one, this idea that I was just mentioning, cultural narratives. Ideas about people in society that are common in the culture and sound like common sense because they are so well common. Everybody knows them. Uh, one example that we heard of from the Ford's uh, grantees and organizations working on social justice was an idea about America, the idea of the self-made man, the rugged individual. Um, the idea that we Americans pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, quote unquote, right? You see how embedded those are in our culture. And that this is one idea associated with is the idea of individual responsibility, that we Americans take responsibility for ourselves. That was one idea common in the culture that a lot of organizations find stands in the way of doing anything to um, help address social inequities and have social programs um, that help people get out of poverty or whatever they might do. So on its, on its face, maybe not negative per se, people value personal responsibility, 
but the way it's used to frame issues in our political dialogue definitely gets in the way of advancing policy um, down those lines. I'm sure folks listening have probably come up against this if they work on those issues. There's another cultural narrative that uh, is also uh, in our culture, but you don't hear as often in our political dialogue. It's about building community. We build communities together. We're stronger when we work together. This is the country where um, people from all walks of life come together and create communities together. That is also in our culture. But the way these narratives work, um, people will respond well to both of these ideas, but what they hear most often is what's going to be top of mind, to use the word from the marketing world, mm -hmm. or what's operative in their worldview. So they got to hear it for it to be operative, right? And what happens with these things, when we hear these ideas again and again and again, we adopt them as part of our worldview and part of our identity. And they shape the way we see ourselves, and that drives the way we think about things and the way we uh, act. This actually reminded me, I don't know if you've seen the new issue of National Geographic. Uh, they just came out with an issue focused on the American West. And it's ironic because it comes on the heels of their race issue from earlier this year. Yeah. The American West issue has, the, Mar the Marlboro Men spurred this in my mind. Right. The Mar they have a cowboy sitting astride a horse. It's dusk. It's a beautiful, classic National Geographic, just gorgeous, color-saturated photograph. And then I think if you go back and you open up the gatefold, you'll see a Native American. But it reinforced this sort of cultural narrative we have about the American West, where, again, that idea yeah. of the cowboy on the plane, conquering hero, and, uh, you know, some of the adjectives that might come to mind around Native Americans that are generally not too positive. It's interesting that even an organization that, like National Geographic, which is on a journey to become more self-aware of some of these narratives, and their role in perpetuating them, yeah. Just a couple of months after after doing a mea culpa on their own role in, huh. in promoting racial differences, yeah, just did with regard to the Native American case. That's really there. interesting and powerful. Those are cultural narratives that have been around in that case for centuries now. Exactly right. Um, yeah. There's a new organization called Illuminative that is working to drive new narratives about Native Americans. If anybody's interested, it's at illuminatives.org. Um, so in this case. Um, what we did with American Aspirations, we talked to people from all walks of life all across the country about their aspirations for their lives and for the kind of country and community they want to live in. And we have a lot of insights and data and ideas from that research, which everybody listening is free to, to look at and use at AmericanAspirations.com. And I'll probably say that 10 times by the way we're done because it's all for you. It's all there for, for you to look at. Uh, this is from one of our surveys, and we ask people these two questions. Do you want to live in a country where people take responsibility for themselves? Eight out of ten say yes. How about a country where people look out for each other? Statistically, pretty much the same number mm -hmm. saying yes. These are not incompatible ideas, but which one do you hear more? That's the thing. If you're, the only way to counter a negative narrative or a dominant narrative is to offer an alternative. You're not going to talk people out of the idea of individual responsibility. You're going to add to that with an idea of social responsibility. And what we've done is talk with people all across the country and focus groups about big ideas like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to show you an example. This is one of the cases where everybody we talk to can pretty much say what individual responsibility means, but pretty much nobody could articulate ideas around social responsibility. And that shows the, the job you have to do if you're trying to drive a, a positive narrative around that idea. So let's take a second now, and as I said, in this case, individual responsibility, that self-made man narrative, a lot of folks working in social, ju social justice have seen that as a negative one that gets in the way. Um, there's lots of ways to think about these. So I want you to take a second and think about the negative narratives that you run into. What kind of cultural narratives are out there that get in the way of the work you're doing that you need to disrupt? Um, and why don't we have folks type in? Yeah, if type you guys in would. Go ahead and, uh, if you've got one. I'm going to call on you because I can see your names in here. Guys, <laughs> I had a method to my madness. Giselle, what's one of the negative narratives that you were trying to disrupt in your work? Megan uh, in Oakland, what about you? Allison in D.C.? Maybe Stephanie in Denver? Sandy in Boston? Who else am I going to pick on? Jane in Boston? Aaron in Atlanta? Uh, Jenna in Finley, Ohio? Melissa? Why don't you guys tell us a couple negative narratives you're trying to get out? Uh, let's see. 
Michelle saying, uh, Michelle Nicolette mm -hmm. says, government is bad. Yeah. Uh, we've heard that a lot in the last couple of weeks. There's tax burden, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jane Baker says, kids and families in need is too, too big. big to solve. Yep. Not too big to fail, too big to solve. Yeah. Nora says, negative narrative, handouts, people contribute to society. Yeah. Um, people with disabilities can't fully contribute to society. Lisa, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. We can't afford it. Business and economy are more important. Uh, Margaret says Latin American and Latino people and culture is second class. That's a narrative that's out there. Mary says students who fail are making a choice in school. Work hard, get good grades. So the, the yeah. idea I guess there, Mary, they're not working hard. Um, if a high, if you guys know this stuff. They're out there, yeah. right? I mean, these this is literally the windmill yeah. upon which you are all tilting. You know yeah. the challenge. Yeah. Um, a number of these, we're going to get into an example later that actually is going to touch on a number of these government roles and so forth. Um, there's some good news. We have some tools that will address that and even some tested language around government, around taxes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot. I'm seeing a few things here, big cultural narratives like that, like government is bad, right? right. Yeah, that is a big cultural narrative in the U.S., and then some around specific issues like healthcare, or that's even a big issue in our consumer culture. If it costs more, it's probably higher quality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's really interesting how many different levels you can see narratives coming to play. Or here, protecting Jean, Jean, if I'm pronouncing your name properly, forgive me, protecting the environment must come at the expense of jobs and industry. Yep. I really, this is an interesting one Sarah has. Everyone has the same opportunities to succeed. If you fail, it's your fault. Right. We literally have language we've tested that addresses that narrative. So these are a lot of cultural narratives, absolutely. We're sort of thinking in similar ways about it. And these narratives appear almost everywhere. I mean, my guess is yeah. for those of you who are working in communications, you're seeing them in your daily work, but we see them in society. We see them on television. And I'm not talking about when you turn on a particular news channel. These are narratives that get perpetuated when you go to the movies, when you pick up a copy of National Geographic, right? Or whether you turn on a television to watch, uh, man, I'm trying to think of a show. I don't watch too much broadcast TV these days. This is us, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. And in conversations. And in people. conversations, yeah. Because a lot of these you've heard just from the people around you. So there are those sorts of cultural narratives that have been developed, that are come, been perpetuated for decades and even centuries. And then there are some that are manufactured and driven, like climate change is a hoax, mm -hmm. right? So we have, you have to deal with all of those things. And the only thing you can do is offer a counter narrative. And we're going to talk about what that means. So staying on this idea of cultural narratives and a big idea, we're at the level of framing. How do you frame an issue? There's lots of ways to talk about that. The thing I keep in mind is a simple directive, frame it first. The first thing you say about a topic is what... Um, influences the perceptions and responses that people have to anything you say about it. And that's what this stuff is about. How do you start the conversation? How do you frame it? Um, and a good rule of thumb to use when you're thinking about, okay, how do I change something like the idea that everybody has equal opportunity if they fail, it's their own idea uh, or it's their own fault. Um, when you're thinking about framing any issues, start first with thinking about how to connect your cause to the aspirations and the values of your audience. Start there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you an example of what that means on an issue many of you heard about, uh, which is marriage equality. Mm -hmm. um, we started working on that issue on day one in Massachusetts, the first state to uh, where a court said that they were going to allow same-sex couples to get marriage licenses. Yeah, you're going to be too much to do this, so I'm going to call this after the people on the call. If you don't know the role that Doug played in arriving at our society to where we are today for gay and lesbian couples, you should go Google him a little bit later yeah. on because he's right. The, the very first day was clad, right? Sued in the state of Massachusetts. Right. I know we don't get bogged down here too yeah. much, but suffice to say, Doug knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, there's a long chapter on this in the book I'm writing on aspirational communication which maybe we could do a preview for the combat folks. That would be great. Just on the marriage stuff. Anyway, the, um, so let's look how that went. We had a dominant cultural narrative. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. um, I put show Barack Obama there not to pick on him. He was, he was my guy, that's for sure. But it took a while to get the Democratic politicians. The Democrats would not touch this issue. Right. It took a while. We had to reframe it, make it safe for them. So when I first started working on this issue, we were at about 27% support 
among the general public, according to Gallup polling. And um, I was told by a you know prominent DC pollster, you're never going to see gay marriage in your lifetime, quote unquote. That's not why I do this sort of thing. It's FYI. It was like we do it to change these sorts of things. So the big idea here is to frame the issue in terms of the aspirations of the audience. People across the country were voting on this. There were at least 30 votes in 30 states, and we lost most of them before reframing it. And the way we went about this was talking to people. You take the topic and don't start with gay marriage. Here's some, one side says this, one side says no. Which do you agree with? If you do that, you step right into the partisan frame, that mm -hmm. dominant frame, and you're just sort of at the mercy of that debate. Start with your audience and ask them, what marriage, what is your aspiration for this? What does it mean to you? And start thinking about how you frame your cause, your position in those terms. When you talk to most people, honestly, about their authentic aspiration, and that's the word used in the social science, the authentic aspiration, what is that really drives our life, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you ask people about marriage, they talk about it as a lifelong commitment. It's a commitment you make somebody that lasts a lifetime, and that's an aspiration. We know actually most don't get there, right. um, and preferably to somebody you love. So love and commitment become the new frame, and I'm sure many folks have heard this now, but this is the very first ad we created using that. This was in Massachusetts. So I think this was probably 2005. And the frame is the headline, literally. Frame it first. Mm -hmm. And that frames your storytelling. And we call it our story, strategic storytelling. If you frame it that way, what we were simply doing was telling stories of loving, committed couples. And there was probably 100,000 stories told that delivered that big idea. There's a few interesting dynamics here. Um, the, this was framed initially as a civil rights issue, which it is. The Constitution says everybody should have equal rights under the law. Marriage licenses are given out by the government. Refusing to give same-sex couples is discrimination under the law. Ergo, you know, it's a, that. And that's all true. And that got us about 27% support. Most of our own uh, constituency, same-sex couples, didn't know how to talk about the law and civil rights and so forth. They knew how to tell their own story. So one hand, it made it easier for them to advocate for their own cause, and it also connected to the audience, because that's the way most people think of it themselves. And it really started a whole new conversation. Um, we'll say a little bit more about this. Um, as you know, we achieved a couple things. We changed public opinion. As of the last Gallup poll I saw, we were at 67% support. We've achieved what the um, uh, social scientists call durable attitude change. It wasn't a finger in the wind sort of thing where they're going to change their mind the mm -hmm. next time they hear a negative narrative from the other side. People have changed their minds on this. Um, and people did have to go from no to yes. Um, and there's a whole science around how you do that. This is just one piece of it. But people really did have time to engage in this and think about it. It wasn't a flash in the pan, it was 10 years from that ad to the Supreme Court. Right. Um, and to Barack Obama and all the other politicians. Evolving. Exactly, right. evolving. We actually, by the way, worked for three months to change the narrative about the politics of same-sex marriage here in DC leading up to the Supreme Court brief because the strategists felt like the court wouldn't want to get ahead of public opinion and needed to know the country was ready for this. Mm -hmm. That was another kind of narrative change that needed to happen, more of a tactical thing. But let's see what's going on behind that, that message, love and commitment. What I want to show you is some more data from our research with the American public about their own values and aspirations. This is a list. You can see the words on the left are just common values words people use to talk about the kind of person they are, the kind of person they want to be, like responsible, loyal, hardworking. We just ask people to look at words like these and rank them on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being extremely important. These are the 10s, all the 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. So you can see how that stacks up um, if you skim that list. So these are all important to somebody. What we see these as is inspiration for thinking about how might I talk about something. I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we think is happening when you look at that story of love and commitment people are seeing responsibility and loyalty and a family orientation. They're seeing their own values reflected. 
that's about the size of what we think is going on. That's empathy, but we saw that's respect, actually. It wasn't feeling sorry for the couples. Mm -hmm. It was like respecting, like, yeah, that's the couple I showed you. They stayed together for, uh, for years, and one of them got cancer, and they stuck through that and everything. People respected that. Um, it's a whole different dynamic. And in the um, school of thought we work with, that's called asset framing. Mm -hmm. Framing people around their positive attributes, their strengths, their aspirations, their values, not just their needs and their challenges. Um, and we have some articles on that uh, asset framing versus deficit framing on our uh, on the American Aspirations website. And trying to be in shorter, if you were with us in San Francisco, yeah. possible, I hope you had a chance to duck in and see Doug and Alfred Ironset from the Ford Foundation talking about narratives, but I hope you also had a chance to see Travian Shorters, who's been spending a lot of time talking about specifically African-American men and how so often when we talk about them in society, whether it's through the media or any number of different channels, we tend to talk about what's lacking as opposed to what exists, all the assets that are out there. Yep. Uh, the next issue of our Change Agent Journal is actually going to feature a piece by Travian that talks about the asset framing approach to thinking about oh, African-Americans. Oh, that's great. Yeah. He's great. Um, and while you're waiting for that, check out American Aspirations. Yeah, we do. have an interview with Travia and an article showing really what, how the, how they at Be Me, mm -hmm. as the name of their group, looks at asset and deficit framing. It's very eye-opening. Another thing going on here is aspirations. Um, we ask people what are their aspirations in life. Same thing, zero to ten. These are, these these are the tens. Interesting stuff at the top. I want to live a life with purpose. I want to enjoy my life every day. I want to respect people who are different. Um, there's a lot you can work with there when you work on meaningful causes. Again, we think going on in the marriage equality issue, I aspire to respect people who are different. Supporting this is one way I can live up to that. I want to live by strong moral principles. It's, this is the right thing to do. I want to make a difference in the world. I can do that this way. Um, in the book I'm writing about this, I interviewed Evan Wolfson, the sort of considered the architect of the strategy of this. He wrote about all this stuff in his law school thesis back in 1983, including the words love and commitment. Wow. FYI. Wow. He was very visionary. And just for folks, if you don't know Evan's work, he led Freedom to Marry, which was one of the dominant uh, marriage equality groups out there for years and years and years. Yes. And what's he doing now? Um, he is sharing the lessons of the movement. Their website, actually, um, freedommary.org, is a whole treasure trove of insights from that movement that you're free to go to and check out. Oh, uh, they share all the lessons. Um, and what he says is we weren't just getting people to vote for our equality because they felt sorry for us or even because they had empathy for us, but you're really hitting it. We helped them live up to the kind of person they wanted to be. Right. That's a really interesting insight about the causes you work on um, and the way you communicate about them and connect with people, um, that's part of the dynamic. Mm -hmm. You're helping people live up to their ideal self, their better self. Um, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, and it becomes part of their self-image and their aspirational image of themselves. Um, so let's stop there and see if folks have questions they want to um, somebody said, what was the name of the organization? <laughs> Just mentioned American Aspirations. Yeah, well, Freedom to Marry could have been the one you were looking for as well. Freedom to Marry, maybe Yabby will put that up on the Twitter feed uh, so that you can get access to that. So any questions about this idea of aspirations and connection to aspirations and values? Uh, let's see, Mark puts this in here. He says, so far so good, but rugged individuals often can be quite charitable, thus in their minds fulfilling the social responsibility issue. The bridge you need to build is the rugged individualist antagonism towards using government to ensure the common good. Any reaction to that? Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's, like I say, not going to talk people out of an idea like individual responsibility and take a yes and approach to these things. Um, when we talk to folks about government, and I'm going to show you later a message we tested on taxes, another one on government, there are definitely ways to talk about both of those things that win over people across the political spectrum um, without trying to talk them out of things like individual responsibility. They can hold both ideas. Um, any other questions about this aspirational approach? Let's go on then to the next section. We're going to, um, next I'm going to talk, dig down a little further into um, 
how to go about narrative change, and then we'll show you some tools that you can use. So this slide says it takes more than a message. Uh, absolutely. We start <laughs> with framing the thing. Right. But let's talk about some of the um, tools that you can use to think about what are the narratives that are operative and how to go about changing them. Uh, this slide says across the top, first map, map the narrative landscape. You can do some homework to figure out what are the narratives we need to deal with mm -hmm. um, on the issue we work on. Create a narrative framework that you can use to counter that, which we're going to dig into, and design a narrative change strategy. You can do it systematically. So starting on the left, we do a content analysis. We look at, um, back to the Ford Foundation, for example, they asked us to look at the content created by 40 different organizations to understand, well, what are the narratives we're putting out? Mm -hmm. Are we clear? Are we intentional? Are we, even, are we even engaging at that level? What we found was that most are not. That's one of the things I can share working on this topic over a number of years now. A lot of us just don't think at that level of framing, at a level of a cultural narrative, and we get caught in these sort of tactical battles. So for example, um, we do a lot of work with different groups working on immigration issues, which of course are um, top concern. And one conversation we had was around language, and somebody brought up, we need a new word for sanctuary cities. Because that's become, as the person said, that's become, mm -hmm. you know, politicized, toxic term. How about safe cities? Got it. Absolutely. The language is absolutely critical. The challenge there is just thinking about it at that level isn't addressing the higher level frame around that issue, which is being driven um, actively in the political culture that we're talking about illegal mm -hmm. immigration. So if you don't deal with that frame, it doesn't matter whether you say safe or sanctuary, it's still you're giving making it safe for people who broke the law, or you're giving sanctuary to people who broke the law. You're really not winning that the right battle there. So yes, you need to think about the words, but you have to get to that higher level frame. And there are positive frames to work with around immigration, absolutely. But that's an example. You have to really mm -hmm. think at that level. So look at what you're already communicating and say, are we really framing it first with high level values and aspirational frames? Look at, a, we can do a media analysis what is actually reaching the people you need to persuade and inspire and engage? Literally, what are they hearing? As you were saying, Sean, before, one of the challenges here is these things come at you from 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's cultural media, it's entertainment media, et cetera. A lot of us are working in the world of news and politics and that's policy debates. So look at that. Who are, are the up narratives that you need that work for you or work against you? Are they really showing up? Um, that can be plotted out quantitatively. You can look at that through social media content or news content and really give yourself a dashboard to work against. A number of foundations um, have our, asked our team to do that for them. Just monitor an issue over, the, over time and help our grantees think about how to engage and drive these, these uh, narratives in the conversation. You can measure whether they show up or not. And then the last is audience insights, of course, what's on people's minds, mm -hmm. and that comes through the kind of public opinion research that you, uh, you can do. The thing with American Aspirations is we're doing a lot of that and sharing it, so I think you'll find a lot of good insights and ideas and food for thought at AmericanAspirations.com, um, and I'm going to show you some examples. So that can give you data for message and strategy, because if you look at the narrative, a narrative on a topic, there's a finite number of individuals and organizations that are actively engaging in these debates and driving dominant narratives. Find out who they are and then engage with those messengers. And then the narrative framework we're going to talk into, we need to do message research and development to figure out the right words. I'm going to show you a narrative framework, which is another way to think about narrative in addition to these cultural ideas winning words, language that has maximum motivating power. And I've also mentioned the idea of strategic stories. Um, you need to be telling stories every day that um, convey the ideas that you need to frame the topic with. I'm going to show examples of that. And finally, for a strategy, we could do a whole session on this if folks are interested. So I'm trying to change narratives. That's a big undertaking. What's, how do I focus my effort? Focus first 
on the people who have to take some action on your cause in order for you to achieve your goal. Literally start with who must do what to achieve our goal, and that gives you real strategic focus. Um, and be really specific about that. Um, of course, policymakers can be straightforward. You need them to vote on, in specific ways, for example. Um, the more focused you are, the more you can focus your resources and get, and get measurable impact. Obviously, you need your influencers who influence those, those uh, primary uh, decision makers and make sure your influencers or messengers are equipped. They think at this narrative level. They know how to talk about these things. Compelling content, designing stories in ways that um, people actually want to read them and listen to them. And storytelling for good is mm -hmm. a great resource for that. Um, you want to say anything about storytelling for good real quick? Yeah, just uh, for, I expect many of you maybe played in the sandbox uh, that we built with Doug's help uh, and our friends over at Rockefeller. Uh, it's at storytelling.comnetwork.org, and it actually offers you online lessons along with case studies uh, and a bunch of tools to help you figure out how to tell clear, compelling stories on the issues that you care about. And there's some worksheets that help you ensure that you aren't just uh, operating in the dark, that you have a really clear strategic purpose, that you know how the story is going to resonate with people and lots of tools to help you get to where you want to go, including some insights into how to use different platforms to get to different audiences. Really good stuff there. Um, so let's move on. The um, other aspects of this are the meaningful engagement. So on the storytelling for good, there is a section on engagement mm -hmm. and how to use the platforms like Tumblr and Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, how to use those really well, which is really good. And those that info there came from those platforms. So you've right. got good inside information on how to use them. But the other thing about meaningful engagement, and it's supported in the social science, it's one of the reasons why I say it takes more than a message. Mm -hmm. The way we're bombarded by messages all day long and visuals and screens, what really breaks through in our world is a human being showing up. And that's still the highest quality of engagement you can have. And how do we really get people together um, to do things together to make change in this world is really where you're getting traction. And how are we meaningful engaging people beyond framing and storytelling? And all this can be measured. Mm -hmm. um, you can measure your narratives that are showing up in the conversation, as I said. We can measure changes in people's awareness and attitudes and actions they're taking. That's what you can be held accountable for as a communicator, and that stuff can be measured, awareness, attitudes, and action. So there's a toolkit there. Can repeat that one more time. Awareness, <laughs> attitudes, and action. Yeah. And we can, this is because we were just doing something on evaluation. This, I think, is a challenge for people that, yeah. yes, there is, in fact, data available to let you know if you've gone from point A to point B when doing communications for good. Right. Those three, and that's like also for us as communicators, let's get everybody really focused. We can do this. We can make people aware of something they weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. What do they need to know? We can change their attitudes, which often gets into how they feel about something, which mm -hmm. is a little squishier. But yeah, what do they believe? How do they perceive it? How do they feel about it? Um, and then what, we can motivate people to do something. And what are those actions? So we'll often brainstorm with our clients and partners, what do people need to know? What do they need to be aware of to care about your cause? How do they need to feel about it? Somebody said here, for example, one of their negative narratives is that like the problem of poverty is too complex to mm -hmm. solve. That's a good one. That gets more into, yeah, they need to feel that it's solvable. Absolutely. That's nowhere, That's a really important attitudinal shift. Yeah. Um, one way we're finding to do that is stories of problems being solved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really one of the, you know, we have achieved A, B, and C. We can do it again. Um, and then, of course, what can we do? And there's tons of metrics for what we can get people to do online. And then measuring behavior change out in the real world gets harder. Uh, but I think this can really help you as a management tool, of managing expectations mm -hmm. of folks that you work with and so forth, and getting people super focused. And we call those communications objectives, awareness, attitudes, action. Um, so let's dig down into this um, narrative framework is a, another way to think about and use narrative. Um, folks who have seen uh, us present at comment and so forth, probably familiar with this framework. This is a pretty simple framework that represents pretty much every story ever told of a protagonist who needs to reach a meaningful goal 
and overcome uh, some sort of obstacle. And what we recommend you do is put the people in the picture, the people you serve, the people you need to persuade, think about everybody and what are their shared values, right? What are their shared goals and aspirations like we did with that marriage? Mm -hmm. Love and commitment wasn't just about same-sex couples. It was about the people voting on same-sex marriage. Right. Everybody could see themselves in the cause. How do you define the problem? Particularly when you have complex problems like intergenerational poverty, structural poverty, the more complex it is, the simpler the frame needs to be. Literally what this is is how you frame each element of a narrative, another way to think of that frame. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you say about the problem? I'm going to show an example on the issue of poverty. And then solutions. This is where you come in and, def and define the, present the ideas that you are working on to address these challenges. So the, the benefit of this is if you start with your audience and their aspirations, you're starting with what people actually care about. It's not about you, it's about them. Then you frame the problem in a way that you want to frame it. Um, that makes it sound solvable, that focuses on what you're trying to achieve, et cetera. And that connects intuitively and immediately to the solutions you're offering. So let's use the idea of, uh, of intergenerational poverty. We were asked to work with a number of organizations that address that issue. This is around the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a number of years ago. Yeah, I was going to say, 58, yeah. right? Yeah, and that, exactly. Um, and we worked with members of the Obama team of the White House. They wanted to have a new narrative about how they were going about addressing poverty as, you know, the administration in the federal government. That required we attack a negative narrative about, quote unquote, welfare. Mm -hmm. Now, most of us sadly know this negative narrative, so I'll, this will be a little warning, I'm going to show it. It's ugly language. That is unfortunately really common in the culture when you mention the word welfare. So looking at this framework, People say, oh yeah, I like the word, the number of times the word lazy comes up when you talk about welfare or even people in poverty mm -hmm. is sad but true. It's a, that comes up very, very often. And what is their, what is their, they really just don't want to work. And they just want to get something for nothing. That's their goal when it comes to this. I'm sure you've all heard this, so I won't belabor it. And the real problem is they don't have a work ethic, right? Um, and these are just handouts. If that sounds familiar, that's a dominant cultural narrative. And it's been pushed actively, easily for decades. So that's what we're up against. And you notice how you have to reframe every part of this. Mm -hmm. It's not just one idea. Um, here's how we did it. That these programs, we got rid of the word welfare programs. These are tools. They offer people tools they can use to work their way out of poverty. That the people we're talking about are families. And this is, re this is reflecting the reality of these programs, right? Mm -hmm. They literally serve families. People, they literally have to be getting job training. Most people who are low income in America actually have multiple jobs. This is true. This is authentic. This is a real story about people who are working hard to get ahead. Absolutely. And their aspirations are very common and similar. They want a job that pays enough to have a decent home and educate their kids and save for retirement. When you talk to a low-income person or a middle-income person, or up, everybody's saying similar things. So people are relating to the aspiration. It's like, oh, well, I, I can see myself in that. Right. Similar to that love and commitment frame. The problem was an interesting thing. Um, one thing that uh, people understand intuitively, we saw it in this work and we saw it in American aspirations. And for the person who said a negative narrative, is that everybody has equal opportunity in America. What we found is actually people don't believe that. They believe that it depends on where you start out in life as to what kind of opportunities you have. And this is one way to express that. Many children don't get an equal start in life. It depends on where you start out as to what kind of opportunities you have. That is not a controversial statement to make to 8 out of 10 Americans, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of common sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we framed it. And that's not trying to frame it and explain intergenerational. That's actually a, a way to talk about intergenerational poverty. And people relate it in concrete ways. You know, the neighborhood you, you grow up in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's how we're framing this. And it's in very human terms. So what do these programs do? Tools that are proven to work that help people 
get jobs and learn how to save money and things like that, very practical things. That's how we reframed it. So we had a good message. Let me show you what that looks like. You can take concepts like that and put it together in a message you can say in less than a minute. That's our framework. We're trying to come up with a way to talk about literally just about anything in just about a minute. Mm -hmm. The people who study this stuff say that the average American English speaker can get out about 150 words in a minute. So that's our benchmark. This one is about, this is like just over 100. So this is, you know, good, you know, something south of a minute yes. to say that narrative. Kids don't get an equal start, hardworking families need tools, blah, blah, blah. So you see, we call those the winning words. Those are the words that make this narrative operative. Mm -hmm. And you could organize this in other ways, but you see the narrative happening here. We tested that in a survey, and seven out of 10, this is of voters um, representing the full spectrum of the American electorate. So liberal, moderate, conservative, blah, blah, blah. Seven out of 10 said that persuaded them that the government should do this. You can use do different themes using the same toolkit. Um, so here's one. A lot of politicians and policymakers wanted to talk about the middle class, quote unquote, and they wanted to talk about the economy, mm -hmm. right? That was their political frame they wanted to use. No problem. We got you covered. <laughs> middle class Americans are the engine of our economy. That is also, by the way, not a controversial statement. To get the economy moving again, the government should blah, 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 blah. So you can tailor these. If you've got that framework, if you've got that toolkit, and you want to stick to your toolkit, it's consistency, stick that framework. It is consistency over time that drives a new narrative. And in this case, we're up against one that's been hammered for decades. Um, again, this one tested similar level. So we saw we had a winner, a winning frame. So then um, we, of course, had to create resources. This was used by dozens and dozens of organizations that work on poverty from research to advocacy um, and programs, human services. They used it for policy and fundraising and all sorts of things. It was used by people in government who work on these topics and they're in all of the, many of the agencies that work um, on uh, social services, et cetera. So we had tools, but as many of you know, a toolkit only, we're all super busy. People need help, particularly if it's changing a habit of mind and a habit of communication is really a habit of mind. Mm -hmm. People on the front lines of the war and poverty have been saying certain things for kind of 30, 40 years, and they were they were ready, they were hungry for a new way to talk about it, and we're very, very grateful for this stuff, but they also needed help. Uh, just literally sort of a fresh set of eyes, a toolkit. So we worked with people over the course of a year. That included the president's speech writing team, here's the word tools. They literally all stop saying programs and start saying tools. So you can do a word search, right? Coming mm -hmm. out of the White House, it's all tools. Out of that White House, I don't. <laughs> I'm, the, the word tools in this White House, I could go to the place, but I'm <laughs> just not going to do it. You turn your own joke, people. Yeah. Uh, this is Sean Donovan, who is Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, inspired by this narrative approach to do a TED Talk and start with a story, which mm -hmm. is another thing we recommend. Start with a story, but frame it first. That's all science there. If you frame it first, what the uh, studies of persuasion show, when you frame it first, love and commitment to reserve protection, let me tell you about Sally and Jill, and then you come back a month later, they've remembered the lesson, they've remembered the frame. If you don't frame it first, if you frame it afterward or don't frame it all, they actually don't. So that's one important thing to remember about storytelling, to be strategic you literally do have to articulate the idea, the lesson, the moral of the story, to use the old school words for it. You have to say it if you really want to drive a change in attitude. And do you have to say it first? First. Or, okay, you have to say, say it, it first. first. That's exactly what it shows. The studies show if you do that, you're going to see higher levels of retention, right, and attitude change. So it's a simple thing to do. It can be the thing is, then you work with your creative people, and they don't want to hear that, right? They just want to tell a good story. Right. These things have to work together. Telling a good story that people actually want to listen to or read, absolutely. Well, I would presume if you're going to start with the frame that you want to end with, what you're not doing is repeating the dominant frame, right? Exactly. In other words, I mean, there's so what I, I'm taking away from this is you don't see the word welfare. No, right? exactly. Like, and the minute you start into that conversation, you've already traveled down the path of driving somebody else's narrative, even if your goal is to disrupt it. Yeah. It really is that improv game of yes and 
That exists. We acknowledge yeah. it, but let's start elsewhere. Do not repeat words that work against you. Do not do it. You mm -hmm. you activate, particularly when it's a dominant narrative, it's top of mind. It's easy for them to act to be activated. If your job, you got to drive a new one, your job's hard enough without <laughs> reminding them of the other side. Um, the, uh, and that depends on your context, of course. You might be arguing against the other side, whatever, that's fine. But one truism is don't activate negative narratives, right, in people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, in a study like this, we will, and I'm going to show you, we do compare frames against each other and show which one wins out. I think you guys will be excited to see some of that because there's a lot of hope and, and promise in that. Um, the, uh, here's another example of one of the agencies, um, Agency for Children and Families, I think. Um, see how they're working the words into every single thing they put out. When you start doing that, you start to change the message you deliver and, the, and what people hear. It's that simple. You can measure that output and the effect. Um, let's stop there and see if folks have, let me look here. Yeah. Um, actually, I'll keep going because it looks like we have 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So there's a the concept of a narrative framework um, and how you can bring different elements of your narrative, make sure it's covered, you've covered all the bases, right? Um, and then I wanted to switch to the tools that are available for you to use at AmericanAspirations.com. Before we do that, let's do, if you don't yeah. mind, let's do a quick lightning round of Jeffrey because we ask everybody yeah. for these narratives that they know. And so maybe we'll put you on the spot a little bit, yeah. but let's talk about what the meta narrative is and maybe the issue narrative, and then people can think on their own about the key messages and strategic stories. So let's see here. Um, da, 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 da. Um, here's one. Uh, diversity looks good, but that's the only way in which it matters. So diversity is all about optics. That's interesting. We have some... Uh, uh, messages we've tested about diversity and its value to the country. Um, so right, so I'm not going to, so to answer that, to counter that with a positive um, frame, I'm not going to talk about optics, right? Another thing too, by the way, is to be careful about buzzwords like diversity. That is, I don't say buzzword to demean it at all, but it is a common word that means different things to different people, mm -hmm. and it's a very common in our world. Uh, like in the circles we run in, so everybody thinks they know what each other is talking about. I had a conversation last week, and I said diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the person looked at me blankly, uh, right. who works in Latino media. Was just, I have no idea what you're, what talking, you're about. talking about. Yeah. So get beyond the buzzword is thing number one, um, because if you don't, the person either has no idea what you're talking about, or what will come up in their mind is how they heard about it last. So, mm -hmm. for example, with this negative narrative that diversity is really just optics, that might be what's on their mind. So you have to frame it for yourself, define it for yourself. Um, so in that case, my take on the meta narrative would be um, diversity is one of our country's strengths because having people with different experiences and backgrounds and ideas makes us stronger. It's one of the things that makes this country special. It's a competitive advantage we have. And that's what it means. Mm -hmm. People from different backgrounds with different perspectives um, coming together. And that's literally language that we tested. And people see diversity in multiple ways. Of course, they see the optical stuff. But most people, we have a database of 400,000 words or so that people said about American, about things like responsibility, opportunity, and diversity. And our linguists map out the narratives. And it was really interesting. Diversity, people say what's behind that word is your life experience, of course. Your background is often the word used there. And your perspective, thus your idea, your view on the world. And people intuitively understand multiple perspectives is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that is good for the country when we respect each other and listen to each other. And it makes us stronger. That's literally a positive narrative about diversity. The negative one was people actually recognizing those, the, you know, the value of it, but we aren't respecting each other. We aren't listening to each other. So it's actually a problem, right? Source of friction. Yeah. For cause of friction and frustration. Both of those ideas are out there. So there's actually interesting things to work with. We tested a number of ish messages around those topics that we'll share. So that's like a method of, yeah, diversity is a good thing. I'm actually going to show you an example of this fleshed out on that theme. So let's move forward on that, actually. Sure. 
Um, what we do here, this is a framing tool that can just sort of prompt you to think about a topic. At that, I'm using the word meta narrative here, that's the cultural narrative. Mm -hmm. Then apply it to an issue. So what's an issue, what's a narrative about diversity? And then an issue we're going to talk about later is um, college admissions and building diverse college campuses. That's an issue. And what are key messages that might be to frame that issue with? And then what are key messages that you might use with different audiences who have different interests? And that's what's a strategic story. I'm actually literally going to show you this on the topic of diversity and college admissions. Okay. Before we get there, let's look at this big idea of responsibility because that was one of the top personal values people had. I mentioned that a lot of people couldn't talk about social responsibility. We also asked people in this work, what responsibility does business have in American society? Talk about crickets, right? <laughs> heard nothing. Right. I'll give you an example of the sort of thing we heard. Um, what you're looking at here is quotes from people in uh, different focus groups. Everything is recorded. And as you can see, we have demographics, age, location, how they perceive their politics, and so forth. So here's a young Latino guy from Tampa saying, and businesses don't have any responsibilities to society. And on the right, here's a middle-aged white guy is kind of like my stats there, uh, more conservative than I am probably, but he's kind of saying the same thing. So we saw across the spectrum people saying a similar idea. So we had a, we had a challenge on our hands. What is the narrative about business responsibility. So what we have done is tested several dozen frames like this against each other. I'm going to show you this one. We tested the dominant frame when it comes to the responsibility of business. You've probably all heard it. It's from Wall Street. It says the sole responsibility of business is to maximize profits. Mm -hmm. yeah. To take care of your shareholders. Exactly. And your shareholders. That's yeah. literally fiduciary responsibility. So there's one more, it takes more than a message to change that. But that's the dominant narrative. So we tested that against this idea on the right. Businesses have responsibilities to their employees, customers, and communities, not just their bottom line. We surveyed people, and this was, we called it an intuitive response. Just look at these and click whichever one that um, you agree with more. Look at this. We got nine out of 10 people agreeing with this. Wow. They never hear that. <laughs> right. Yeah. But when they saw it, they agreed with it. I presented this to a group um, in Minnesota uh, working on issues, there was like, you know, people were tearing up, like, wow, we can work with that. Yeah. Right? It, it works on a lot of levels, right? I mean, I can see a ton of issues in there. Precisely. That's the sort of thing. If we were working on 100 issues and 1,000 stories every day about that, you'd start to change some narrative. Mm -hmm. I'll show you a couple of examples of how to use that. Here's an example of using it as a frame for storytelling. This is a video about um, living wages. Frame it first. Businesses have responsibilities. Let's tell the story of this business, mm -hmm. right? Um, we have lots of examples. In this case, we're showing examples of businesses that were providing living wages, mm -hmm. showing an example of the solution of good examples, not just the problem. So we leaned into that positive storytelling. Um, so here's looking at that issue, living wages. Here's our meta narrative, the cultural narrative we want to be common in the culture. Businesses have responsibilities, so they have a responsibility to pay living wages. There's your issue frame, um, and paying good wages drives economic growth, right? That's mm -hmm. just a specific, there's probably other messages you could use for people with different interests. And let's tell our stories of responsible business leaders. Isn't that cool? How the word responsible starts to take on a whole new meaning. Yeah, and it is real. That's meaningful. That's not just spin, right? Absolutely. This is meaningful narrative change and storytelling. Um, that's one and we're seeing it play out. I mean, I think uh, not to go into the political realm too much, but if you looked at some of the results out of the elections, you saw a lot of red states doing really curious things when it came to ballot initiatives. Living wage yep. measures passed in Arizona, a couple of other what I would think of as purple to red states, yep. where the people on the ticket may have had more conservative or, or yep. rightward political leanings, but on questions of quality of life and, and personal responsibility and aspiration, you saw these things move. Yeah. And, and there seems to be, uh, at the face of it, a dissonance. Mm. Right? But actually what you're telling us is, I guess, 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 people say business is a responsibility. There is, in fact, quite a bit of people, quite a number of people who hold competing ideas within their heads. I yeah. guess probably normal, right? Yeah, absolutely. That is normal. That is the, that's what it means to be human. <laughs> <laughs> we have cognitive dissonance. We have conflicting ideas, values, and emotions. A 30-second side on that. Please. 
What the science says, when, when we have cognitive dissonance, that causes psychological pain and makes us uncomfortable. We like everything to be neat and predictable. So we will either, marriage is a good example. Our audience was people who were conflicted. We weren't trying to change the minds of people who like were anti-gay or whatever. It was, my aspiration is to be uh, open-minded and fair-minded and compassionate and to respect people who are different and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was raised believing marriage is a man and a woman. It was a religious thing, et cetera. That's a genuine internal conflict. It's not about being a bigot or whatever, right? And not that bigotry isn't out there. But look at people who genuinely have a conflict. Resolve the conflict in the favor of your cause. People who are conflicted like that will either, to use the psychological terms, avoid. Like, I don't want to deal with this. Right. right? Easy. Yeah. Or approach it. They will approach it, try to figure it out, try to resolve it, and that's your opportunity. Find people who are conflicted and help them approach and resolve it. That's what we did with the marriage thing. And that's, you can read all about it. Yeah. There's a number of steps to doing that. But that's your target audience for super strategic focus is people who have a conflict like that. Um, for one thing, for persuasion versus mobilizing people already agree with you. That's another objective. Right. So what I'm going to just cut to the chase and show you examples of this tool, this framing tool is on the AmericanAspirations.com website. It's, um, it's a guidebook. So that tool is right there and I'll prompt you to think about it. It uses this example. What you're also going to find is a set of messages we've already tested. Um, these are messages that relate to diversity and inclusion. We didn't test the word inclusion. This is just a category. Mm -hmm. And you can see things like what we've done. When you look, you'll see they're side-by-side -side messages. Dominant or problematic messages versus these, mm -hmm. which from our perspective are messages that um, promote social justice thinking. So you can see this sort of, here's America's diversity is our unique strength. When we respect one another, work together, makes our country stronger. 68%, yeah. right? That was how I answered you. Yep. I know I'm like, I'm quick on the draw, <laughs> but I actually had all this stuff. So what you've got there on inclusion, we have uh, messages about contribution and social responsibility. We actually use the word contribution. What you'll find there, testing a message, taxes are a burden on families and businesses, dominant narrative, mm -hmm. versus taxes are a contribution to make our country work right, by, you know, educating our kids and building the roads and et cetera, et cetera. That's, that is one we set up, and I'll let people go find out what the result was. But we did a dot, we framed burden versus contribution. And you might be surprised what you find. And I'm guessing that you can actually tell some pretty amazing stories about what those contributions can yield, right? That a teacher at your kid's school or whatever it might be. You know the people who benefit from these contributions. The, a thousand stories to be told and more yeah. about how your taxes contribute to curing diseases, putting people on the moon, right? Yeah. Educating the kids down the street. It's all real. It's all real. That's authentic storytelling that really, my little story on that is uh, um, my niece married a tax lawyer. I'm and sorry. they, they came, <laughs> to, uh, came to D.C. for a trip and with the kids and took them down to Smithsonian. And he'd never been. He's like, well, these are great museums. I can't believe they don't cost a dime. I'm like, yeah, you contributed to it through your taxes. He's like, oh, when you put it that way, it doesn't seem so, sound so bad. Yeah. Right? And his job is to help people get out of paying taxes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's literally worked on a dime. Right? <laughs> now he has many other countervailing pressures. <laughs> but in that moment, he's like, oh, yeah, that's contribution. Right. Powerful stuff. Um, so definitely go to AmericanAspirations.com to see what we got. Here's an example of applying one of those to the topic of college admissions. America's diversity is our strength. There's lots of things you can say about that when mm -hmm. we respect one another, work together, blah, blah, blah. Let's apply this to colleges. To succeed in our diverse society, you need to know how to work with people from different backgrounds, life experiences, and perspectives. Mm -hmm. Those are the words we use to define diversity, get beyond the buzzword. Right. That's why colleges work to create diverse campus communities and educational experiences. You might have noticed there's a big fight going on about this. Yeah, I have up in Boston. Yep. Um, so colleges need to have freedom and flexibility to provide that diverse educational experiences that all of our students need to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. All of that works as a narrative, and then you tell a thousand stories about diverse campuses or students are learning from each other and learning meaningful things from each other and also useful skills 
to go out and succeed in, this, in a diverse workforce and, in fact, give us a competitive advantage in the world. So that's how we're going from negative narrative issue narrative, et cetera. Um, and under key messages here, you know, there's half a dozen there depending on people's interest in just promoting diversity and opportunity or America's competitive advantage or whatever, what have you. Um, so I think folks will find a lot of useful tools. I'll just say it one more time. At American American com. And I will actually, as I've been listening to you, one of the things that, uh, that uh, it, it prompts you to think about is, Tristan, you're going to have to help me with the name of the show, but there's a comedian named Hassan Minaj. He was a correspondent on The Daily Show. He has a program on Netflix Patriot now called Act. Patriot Act. Yeah. yeah. So if you are so inclined, it's a little bit of fun homework tonight, maybe take that meta-narrative worksheet that Doug has given you, watch the Amazon episode, huh. or uh, there's an episode actually on diversity in schools. Uh, I think it's actually a sidebar at the end of the Amazon episode. In any event, if you flip on Patriot Act on Netflix, if you have a Netflix subscription, Son Minaj, Patriot Act, watch that and map out the narratives. It's fascinating. It's also a really good example of how people are getting information in new and different ways. Because we live in the information age and people are just consuming more That's and more. That's a great idea. So uh, have yeah. some fun with that because actually the takeaway on the Amazon piece is, Tristan, you want to you wanna frame it up for us? What was his big takeaway? Something about woke uh, and lazy. <laughs> people are more inclined to just go with what's convenient. That's right, convenient. Yeah. <laughs> that is interesting because when you start, when you open your ears for these cultural narratives, it's not hard once the light bulb goes off. That's the battle you need to think about fighting. Um, that's a cool idea. I did want to address one question I, that Melissa asked. All this is very positive, wondering what you think about Ian Haney Lopez and not Shanko Zorio's research, which shows success using an, an enemy using dog whistles on race to divide us. Very familiar with that, and I've consulted with both of them on this work as well. Um, it is different from the idea of positive assets, although it does point to when we come together, all races being named, we have succeeded against dog whistles. Uh, that's a great question. I think that's great work. It's uh, at demos.org. Demos mm -hmm. is the organization that, com that uh, commissioned it. It's a race class narrative. What they found is to combat dog whistle politics where um, actors in our political debate are using race. It's a lot more explicit now than it has been, right? Um, but they're trying to divide each other. What this says is you need to point at that and name it and say why they're doing it. Um, that's supported by work like by Drew Weston in the political brain, mm -hmm. because when there is a dog whistle, because it's supposed to be subtle, right, right. not stated, um, and it activates the negative narrative that you had in your head, right? Mm -hmm. So when you make people conscious of it, they can, they can consciously decide they don't want to be governed by said negative narrative, right? You have to bring them out of their sleepy, lazy state and actively thinking about it. But this, this isn't necessarily counter to asset framing. What we said about asset framing is when you're talking about a group of people, and this is when you're getting into, like we were talking about people who get help from government anti-poverty programs or same-sex couples. This is where you're getting into othering, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. And people, and this, the term is social distance. A lot of folks in your audience won't see themselves in the same group with same-sex same sex couples or people who get help from government uh, anti-poverty programs. So there's less um, affinity or empathy. It's just a natural that they're in a different category, so that's not necessarily me, right? So what we're doing, saying is when you're talking about groups, different groups, focus on the shared aspirations and values. That's asset framing. It's positive, showing the assets. It also reduces that social distance oh, you want to get married for the same reasons I do, right? Mm -hmm. and, this, and that's the thing. It's like, yeah, you're different, quote, unquote, but we both share that aspiration, right? Um, oh, you're looking for the same things I am. You want to, you know, have a nice home and educate your kids and feel secure in retirement. Me too. Right. So that's how you're closing that social distance. So that's about asset framing. But here, point out people who point out the messages when somebody's trying to divide the country. So they have a really good... Um, message about this that um, and they use the and they name white black brown Americans working together they actually put those words on the table that makes it super specific and clear what we're talking about um, and that we can make this economy work for everybody whether you're white black brown that sort of thing mm -hmm. um, is looks super promising and I recommend people look it up 
and use it. We're testing it in other projects right now. Um, so that is the race class narrative work at demos.org. I highly recommend it. Thank you very much. And actually, I think we've run out of time, so I should say thank you very, very much, Doug, for coming back. Uh, and we will. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Any sense of uh, of an ETA? I don't want. I just want right, right. to ask an author. Yeah, don't pressure me. <laughs> Next year. Next year. Okay, great. Well, listen, everybody. Thanks for sticking around with us. Uh, please take advantage of storytelling at comnetwork.org. Please visit AmericanAspirations.com. You can see it there on the screen. We will be back again in a couple of weeks, I believe. Uh, but in the meantime, happy holidays, have a wonderful, safe Thanksgiving. Uh, and give us a shout if you have any questions. We'll be back in touch soon, and this will all be up online in the next couple of days. Uh, and if you want to refresh again, go to the ComNet Live hashtag on Twitter, and you can see all the notes that Yabby made. Thanks very much, everybody.